Good evening, dear guests. Welcome to Georgetown University. The director, board, and staff member of Al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding would like to thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's Building Bridges Lifetime Achievement Award for this year. And now I would like to invite Dr. John Esposito, our founding director, for his welcome speech. To begin with, I'd like to tell you at least a little bit about the center and then move into that. So it provides you some background for why we're here and what we're doing. We were founded in 1993 as the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, History, and International Affairs. Uh, it was a group of Arab uh, Christian and uh, Muslim businessmen from the Gulf, uh, led by Hasib Sabag, uh, who was, uh, uh, was, he's passed away, a Maronite Catholic. And their concern was that with the end of the Cold War, Islam might be seen as the next global threat. Um, parenthetically, I had, around that time, written a book called The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality. And whether or not it's a true story or not, the former presidents uh, said, and also uh, Hasib's fr uh, friend, that when they were considering uh, a director and putting the center here, his friend took him to a book shop, and there was my book, The Islamic Threat. So who knows? I felt the spirit moved, but we don't know about that. Uh, but it, it was a very unique situation. In 2005, we received an endowment which assured the endowment of the center and its future. And, and that was, for me, a, a major goal. And it came from uh, Prince Al-Walid bin Talab. Our center has become internationally recognized as a leader in the study of Islam and the history of Muslim-Christian relations. Now, everybody's going to say that, so you have to go on the internet and take a look and see if you can corroborate it, okay? If you do, you'll also see that we also have our not-so-friendly friends uh, who are concerned. Uh, we're the Islamophobes' delight of the month. Uh, but the reality of it is that we were able to really hit the ground because Georgetown was willing not just to create a center, but to create a center where I would be able to bring in the first faculty who would all be senior people who already had a national and international reputation. So we could create facts on the ground in terms of, rather than people looking and just waiting for four or five years for us to be able to do that. And Al-Walid, years later when I approached him for the endowment, uh, was attracted by that idea also. At first he said, why should I give money to Georgetown? You people already exist. And I said, well, we need to expand the program. And you know, when you go to invest your money, you want to invest it. Do you invest it in a new company that's just started and it has no track record? Or do you invest it in an outfit that has a track record? So it's, it's been quite a ride for all of us uh, over the years. The center also reflects very much Georgetown's Jesuit heritage that recognizes the importance of interfaith relations and understanding the role that religion plays within contemporary societies and international affairs. Now, I should point out to you that one of the unique things about Georgetown, if you go up to our website, you, you will feel that you've never seen so many chaplains. I mean, it's really remarkable for, you know, for the university. I mean, uh, the number of them is just incredible. I hadn't looked at it closely for about 10 years, and we have almost as many chaplains as we have students, slight exaggeration. <laughs> But the representation of, of all of the different faiths, you know, and the fact that we were the first university, for example, <clears throat> to hire a full-time Muslim chaplain. Uh, but, but it's also an incredible array of chaplains that underscore the importance of religion. And I think it's particularly important in our society, uh, I thought in the past, but certainly uh, where we are today and the times that we're, we're, we're moving through. The presence and the impact of Islam and Christianity, the two largest world religions, there are roughly 2.3 billion Christians, and roughly, it all depends on the, who you get on the, on the website to look this up, and 2 billion Muslims. Uh, two years ago or three years ago, the Vatican uh, made a statement saying that there were more Muslims than there were Catholics in the world. But it's just a statistic to think about. Because when you compare it to the other religions that are world religions, they're actually, their numbers are actually considerably smaller in terms of their, their numbers. <coughs> so the importance of these religions is a fact of international life today. Relating to the role and impact of these religions on global affairs is a focal point of the center. 
and our, our, our course teaching, our publications, et cetera. ACMCU, that's the acronym, uh, course uh, offerings, it's faculty and publishing, it's national reputation, reputation internationally, and it's extensive community outreach and education projects have promoted Muslim-Christian relations and interfaith understanding and religious pluralism globally. Our faculty's publications have appeared in 55 languages, for example. Our, our bridge project, which is about Islamophobia, protecting pluralism, ending Islamophobia, has 1.1 million followers. So there's a need out there. And it's not just a question about talking about whether or not we meet that need. The fact is, what the stats wind up telling you is that there is an incredible need out there. Uh, we won't get into it tonight, but in fact, Islamophobia is growing far more globally than before. If you look at what's happening with regard to the Uyghurs in China, the Rohingya in Myanmar, the form of Burma, or you look at what's going on in India, uh, and one can go on and on and on. The fact that, and I think it's wonderful, <clears throat> that Hungary and other countries are taking in immigrants, Ukrainian immigrants, but these are countries that didn't want any immigrants when it came to taking people from the Muslim world. So that's the kind of where we live in. And unfortunately, we as Americans can't think that we're talking about the rest of the world. All you have to think about is our last presidency and what the position was with regard to not just Muslim immigrants, but many immigrants in general. During this past year, we've created three major initiatives, which I think have been very important. For the first time, we have a minor in Islam and Muslim Christian relations. We've created also a, uh, uh, and funded a project with Asian studies that actually looks at the role of Islam in Southeast Asia and looks at in terms of issues of, of religion, ethnicity, uh, and violence. And we've created a global anti-racism initiative which provides scholarships for undergrads and grads uh, to work on their area of research with regard to global anti-racism, uh, support them, support their travel, et cetera. Now, the Center's annual Building Bridges Lifetime Achievement Award brings us together to honor leaders whose lives and actions strengthen our Center's mission. Through this award, we celebrate their responses to issues of religious freedom, interfaith relations, human rights, social justice, and peace building. I don't have time to talk about <clears throat> many of our awardees, but I just thought I'd mention a few. Michelle Sabah, the Archbishop and Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, a Palestinian, who was and is a guiding light for his community of, Palestine, of, of Palestinian Muslims and Christians. Professor Hans Kuhn, the prolific and prominent Catholic theologian who served as a theological expert at Vatican II. I was a young Catholic theologian. As some people know, I was with the Capuchins for many years before that. I, and Kung was part of the, the hero of, of that period, uh, a remarkable man. He promoted interfaith relations worldwide, and in particular was the founder and president of the Foundation for a Global Ethic. And you know, to have somebody of his prominence come here and be so excited about getting the award was really amazing. You know, it was, I kind of thought he's just being polite. You know, he just, because he kept, you know, talking about it. He talked about it publicly, and, and his speech was terrific. But if you ask me for the content, what I remember most about it was, it was a moving speech in which he entered, this was Obama's time, with, yes, we can, yes, we can, yes, we can. So he had an audience almost off its feet. He was just, he was really, really an amazing person. Najah Bazi, founder and CEO, <clears throat> as well as an unpaid executive director for a nonprofit group called Zaman. Hope for, human, uh, for hum uh, Humanity Center. Now, the amazing thing about Najah and that project is she was going to create, and I spoke at one of her first fundraisers, almost like a, a village for Muslims to come and live in, particularly as they got older and they would have all kinds of services, they could have homes, etc. And then she, she said to me about a year later, I looked and thought, who needs it the most? And she went in an area, this happened when I gave her the award, I'm sorry. Very embarrassing. I cried at my wedding, my wife didn't. <laughs> I was great on the altar, because I could tell her exactly what to do. She was a public school girl, 
now's the time to move this way and that way. And then you go to the back and you're greeting everybody who comes out and I lose it and she handles the whole situation. So I'm glad she couldn't make it tonight. Um, but this woman created something in an area where Henry Ford had hired black people to work, but had built small houses for them in a completely different area, very run down over the years. And then after that period, people who were, many of them were single mom, <coughs> excuse me, single moms and didn't have much money moved in there. Najat got a huge Quonset hunt and created an incredible store of clothing, you name it, to go and shop, and people could shop and not have to pay for it. They could go and pick out all of the objects that they wanted. She serviced, just in the time I was there, 215,000 people, and actually her project has impacted 1.5 million. And last year, CNN had a big contest about, the, you know, for like the top 10 in the country, and she was one of the finalists in there. Ingrid Matson, a convert to Islam, prominent Islamic scholar, the first woman to be elected president of the Islamic Society of North America. And I'm happy that Syed Saeed, my colleague, is here, who's the current president. We go back many, many years. And as I said to his granddaughter, uh, when my mentor, you know what I'm going to say, right? When my mentor passed away, we did a, a, a program in Washington. And uh, we were both emotional about it. And he grabbed me and hugged me. And I said to him at one point, you're hugging me closer and tighter than my wife and I have actually hugged each other in terms of time. And so every time I see him, it's always, will that happen? But in any case, uh, he's been an incredible voice for Muslims in America for decades and was an early leader of ISNA and president and more recently has become a president and really left a mark. Uh, his family situation is interesting to me because I, you know, I taught his daughter, but also as an example of how Muslims revere Moses and Jesus, two boys, Musa and Isa. And, and both have gone on to prominent careers. Uh, his daughter, who is in my class, prominent career. It's, it's, a, it's a, re a remarkable uh, family. Now I'd like to welcome Nuncio Archbishop Christophe Pierre, Cardinal Supic, Imam Mujahid, all of whom you will be hearing, and particularly to invite our president, John J. DeJoya. Well, thank you very much, John. Welcome, everybody. It is an honor to be here with you this evening, and welcome to Riggs Library. This is the venue we use for our, our most special occasions, and I'm honored to welcome um, Imam Muha Mu Mujahid and Your Eminence, uh, Cardinal Blaise Supic. I want to thank you both for your presence and for sharing your reflections later this evening as we present both of you with this year's Building Bridges Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, as we celebrate this evening, as John has just shared, we are honored to have His Excellency Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, who has served in this capacity since 2016. We're very honored that you could be with us, with us this evening. I also wish to thank all of my colleagues from the Prince Awalid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding for providing this opportunity for us to be together and to honor the commitment we have to interreligious dialogue. We have not been together that many times over these last two years. It was two years ago today that we went virtual. So it really is special to be together with all of you. <laughs> well, I want to thank so many members of our Georgetown community and our broader community for joining us this evening. What this evening represents, I believe, is the depth of commitment and the bonds that have been formed over years of dialogue and engagement, important work that continues to advance the common good. We are grateful for your presence and for your shared commitment to interreligious understanding. I think over the past decades, we have been called to an 
ever deeper engagement across our faith traditions to build and sustain mutual respect, dialogue, and collaboration, and a shared commitment to social justice. Tonight, we recognize the contributions of two individuals who have dedicated themselves to the advancement of interfaith understanding. Each has made extraordinary con contributions to this work. Uh, Car Cardinal Supic as the inaugural co-chair of the National Catholic Muslim Dialogue at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and Imam as, as chair of the Council for Parliament of World Religions. Both have sought to advance dialogue across religious traditions. Cardinal Supic in his role as the Archbishop of Chicago and, and Imam Mujahid through the organization he founded, Sound Vision, a media and outreach organization focused on Muslim news in North America and also the organization Justice for All focused on human rights. Their impact has had a national and global reach, and they have advanced interfaith work in the city they share, Chicago. In their commitment and dedication to building bridges across faith traditions, we see the words of Pope Francis and Sheikh Ahmed Al Tayeb, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar, come alive in the document on human fraternity, which they signed together in 2019 and an historic example of interfaith collaboration. Together they wrote, and I quote, the firm conviction that authentic teachings of religions invite us to remain rooted in the values of peace, mutual understanding, human fraternity, and harmonious coexistence, close quote. Your Eminence, Imam, we want to thank you for your leadership in advancing interfaith engagement, for the privilege of honoring you this, with this award this evening. And I again want to thank my, my dear friend and colleague of, of nearly three decades, John Esposito, for bringing us together in this wonderful celebration tonight. So thank you both. Thank you very much, our uh, dear president, John DeJoya. That was very inspiring. And I will have the honor to invite Imam Yahya Hindi, the director of Muslim Life at Georgetown University, to do the invocation. Thank you very much. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Honorable President DeJoya, your Excellency Archbishop Pierre, Your Eminence Cardinal Kovic, Honorable Imam Mujahid, Honorable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of God be upon you. And Professor John Esposito, thank you for reminding me I'm, I'm old becoming the first Muslim chaplain at Georgetown and in the country. It has been actually 23 years this coming June. It has been a challenge, but what a good challenge, working with the amazing community, wonderful members of our amazing Jesuit University. It has been quite an experience, working with you, working with each and every one of you here and others to push for an agenda that espouses uh, passion for compassion and passion for justice. In my, it is my honor to have been asked to offer the invocation at such a unifying event. Unity much needed in a world gone crazy, divided with conflicts and wars. Nothing is more inspiring that than these kinds of moments that to bring us together for justice and dialogue. Because of that, for that, let us pray. Almighty One, we ask for your blessings upon this gathering made for your glory. Continue to empower the recipients of tonight's awards to be men in service of others. It is you, God, 
who taught us that by serving each other, we are serving and reaching out to you. Guide our awards recipients to use these moments and their leadership to bring about a world in which we live with each other with the mutual respect and with justice for all. God, we trust that you will continue to give them the wisdom to know their role in tearing down walls of separation and putting up bridges of hope, unity, and understanding. God, continue to make them among whom who are in love with humanity, not publicity, in love with justice, not money, and among those people whom the spoils of life cannot buy, and of those who speak for all, your entire creation. Let there be truth on this earth, God, the truth that will build peace only if every individual sincerely acknowledges not only their rights, but also their duties towards others. Let there be justice, God, which will build peace if in practice everyone respects the rights of others and actually fulfills his duties towards others. Let there be love, God which will build peace if people feel the needs of others as their own and share what they have with others, especially the values of mind and spirit. God, may our love of you open doors of unconditional hospitality for all. May our joint hands free more divine energy lost in the maze of wars. May our faith in you, God, overcome uncertainties of the future. May our clarity about who we are lead the way of respect of others' certainty of their own path. May our, our mutual respect of each other shed light on days of immense darkness. May our open-mindedness tonight and forever bear witness to the great possibilities of the future. For a compassionate world, God, with leaders like these, lead us all with your holy presence to bring about politics of justice, economics of equity, and covenant of community. Bless this meal that we are about to receive. And bless those who made it possible. For which God we are grateful. Ya salamu, ya rahimu, ya karimu, ya wadudu, ya latifu, ya khabiru. O peaceful, O merciful, O caring, O loving, O kind, O embracing God. The dominion is yours forever and ever. And with a united voice, let us all say, Amen. Thank you. I'd like to invite Professor Scott Alexander, who will be uh, providing the first uh, pr presentation uh, for the Cardinal. Where are you, Scott? Oh, there you are. OK. I told you these glasses are not working. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with you. If I may linger on the words of this beautiful traditional Muslim greeting for just a moment, I'd like to underscore that the word salam, the Arabic and Quranic cognate for the word shalom in biblical Hebrew, does not connote merely the absence of overt violent conflict, but rather a peace solidly anchored in the enduring presence of justice. In fact, it literally refers to the abiding safety from all forms of aggression and oppression that all creatures require to thrive and flourish. To invoke and seek this peace is to dedicate ourselves to the unwavering pursuit of justice, even and especially when we ourselves, and not just they, our enemies, are the perpetrators of injustice. 
It means denouncing warfare not only when a self-absorbed and deluded dictator decides to extend and affect regime change by perpetrating atrocities on millions of his innocent and far less powerful neighbors. It means doing the same when we are the ones who feel threatened and decide to use violence in futile attempts to secure our own prosperity. It means asking difficult questions like what it says about societies that are rightfully united in solidarity with millions of suffering Christian and Jewish Ukrainian refugees from the global north and yet at the very same time are sharply divided over whether to be in solidarity with or against refugees and other migrants from the global south, such as Muslims from Syria and Myanmar or even Roman Catholics from Central America. The teachings of the Quran and the Gospel are clear when it comes to the kind of commitment to equity and justice required of those who aspire to faith in God. It must be radical and uncompromising. Surah Nisa, verse 135, reminds us that as witnesses to God, the faithful must, quote, be unrelenting in equity, even if it be against our very selves, or parents, or relatives, or friends. And in Matthew 5, Jesus enjoins his disciples to emulate the perfection of their heavenly Father through the practice of an equity so radical that it requires loving one's enemies and praying for one's persecutors. How blessed then are we that it is precisely such an uncompromising commitment to equity and justice that brings us together to celebrate both of our distinguished Building Bridges Lifetime Achievement honorees. Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid, whom Professor Esposito will be introducing a bit later on, and Cardinal Blaise Joseph Supich, whom I have the privilege of introducing to you now. I like to think that the uncompromising commitment to justice and equity that has characterized the vocation of Blaise Joseph Supich as a disciple of Christ and a Roman Catholic presbyter had its roots at the dinner table of the elder Blaise and Mary Supich back in Omaha, Nebraska, where young Blaise grew up as one of nine children. Although I'm, only, I'm an only child with no idea of what it means to have even one sibling, it seems to me undeniable that with the right parents as teachers, there can be no better school of equity and justice than the experience of growing up with five sisters and three brothers. I also like to think that there's a special significance to the fact that his eminence was born on the 19th of March, the Solemnity of St. Joseph. As Blaise Joseph, the Cardinal bears the name of that righteous Nazarene artisan whose deep sense of justice rooted in his covenant faithfulness motivated him to legitimize love and care for a woman pregnant with a child whom he did not sire, but whom he committed to nurture and love as every bit his own. Ordained at the tender age of 26, Blaise Joseph Supich spent time as a pastor at two different parishes in his native Omaha, where he must have learned, most likely the hard way, the essence of inspired leadership. It had to have been in those parish ministries that he developed that rare ability to discern that elusive third way that marries those two age-old rivals, the responsibility to foster communal cohesiveness and the commitment to advocate for and stand with those on the margins. In July of 1998, at just 49 years of age, Father Supich was appointed by St. Pope John Paul II to be Bishop of Rapid City, South Dakota, and was ordained a bishop shortly thereafter. And 12 years later, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him Bishop of Spokane, Washington, where he served until in 2014, His Holiness Pope Francis appointed him to succeed the retiring Francis Cardinal George of Blessed Memory as the ninth Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Now, I'm embarrassed to admit that I knew next to nothing about his eminence before he arrived on the scene in Chicago as the new Archbishop of the local church that I had been a part of for almost 14 years. I suspect that the context in which I first met and began to learn from and collaborate with his eminence has a lot to do with why I'm standing before you this evening. As my longtime exemplar and mentor, John Esposito, is well aware, Cardinal Supich is not only the bishop of the diocese in which I practice my faith, but he has also been the chair, as he mentioned, of the National Dialogue Initiative with Muslims of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's in this capacity that I have been blessed to be a personal witness 
to Cardinal Supic's uncompromising commitment to justice, as well as to the rare brand of courage it takes to live out that commitment as one of the highest ranking leaders of an American Catholic church that is sorely divided over critical social and moral issues. I can remember clear as day the first time Cardinal Supic addressed the National Catholic Muslim Dialogue as its Roman Catholic co-chair. He spoke openly of, quote, the sin of Islamophobia, unquote. My heart skipped a beat as I noted the look of surprise and profound appreciation on the faces of our Muslim dialogue partners who, until that point, had become frustratingly accustomed to some of the Catholic members of the dialogue regularly questioning the existence of a systemic hatred and marginalization their Muslim colleagues experienced daily. To utter the three simple words, sin of Islamophobia, was to take a stand that didn't just require the signature wisdom and compassion of any seasoned pastor, it also took courage. And for as long as God continues to preserve my memory, I will never forget the 29th of January, 2017. It was the day I read the Cardinal's game-changing statement of then-President Donald J. Trump's executive order on refugees and migrants. As if to strip the order of any veneer of moral legitimacy to which it made only the thinnest rhetorical pretense, the Cardinal opened his statement with these prophetic words. Quote, this weekend proved to be a dark moment in U.S. history. The executive order to turn away refugees and to close our nation to those, particularly Muslims, fleeing violence, oppression, and persecution is contrary to both Catholic and American values. Have we not repeated the disastrous decisions of those in the past? who turned away other people fleeing violence, leaving certain ethnicities and religions marginalized and excluded? We Catholics know that history well, for like others, we have been on the other side of such decisions. Did this take wisdom? Certainly. Compassion? Most assuredly. But it also took tremendous courage. It took the kind of courage that risked his credibility among a large block of the faithful, including some of his brother bishops, for the sake of his uncompromising commitment to justice for his Muslim sisters and brothers in need. Early in his pontificate, in an interview Pope Francis gave to a fellow Jesuit, His Holiness struck his now famous metaphor of the church as a field hospital after battle, an allusion to what we refer to in stateside political discourse as the culture wars. This metaphor of the church as a place where Catholics and people of all faiths or no faiths can come to heal and restore the divinely ordained wholeness and integrity of the human family is one that resonates deeply in the hearts and minds of those of us who have dedicated the better part of our lives to Catholic-Muslim dialogue of theological exchange, spiritual experience, social action, and everyday life. As someone involved in Catholic-Muslim dialogue for almost 40 years, I bear witness that to the extent this dialogue is one of the primary treatments employed by the church as a field hospital, Cardinal Supic is one of its chief attending physicians. How good and fitting it is that as Muslims seek God's forgiveness and healing in Nusf al-Sha'ban, and as Roman Catholics and other Christians do the same in the second week of Lent, we give thanks and praise to God Almighty for the gifts of God's servants, Blaise Joseph Supic and Abdul Malik Mujahid. On behalf of the Scholars Advisory Board of the Awalid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University, and in recognition of his uncompromising commitment to justice and the inspired courage of his leadership in Catholic Muslim dialogue, reconciliation, and bridge building, it is my entirely unmerited honor to present to His Eminence Cardinal Blaise Joseph Supic. Archbishop of Chicago, this Lifetime Achievement Award on this 16th day of March, 2022, the 14th day of Sha'ban, 
Thank you so much. Well, that was a, a very nice introduction, and I'm grateful to you, Scott, for, for coming here and being a part of this. I want to thank uh, President uh, John uh, Jack DeJoya for his hospitality here, and also uh, Dr. John Esposito, the director of the Al-Walid uh, Center. Um, this is a great honor to receive uh, the Building Bridges of Understanding Award, and, and I want to congratulate as well uh, my uh, co-recipient here, uh, Imam Abdul Malik Majahid, uh, for sharing this with, with this great honor with me today. You know, I have uh, very fond memories of um, being here on this wonderful campus uh, 40 years ago, because almost every day during the 1980s when I worked at, uh, here in Washington, my former boss, the late uh, Cardinal Piolaghi, insisted uh, that uh, we come to play squash in the Yates Fieldhouse, and to do so after uh, enjoying a large Italian pranzo rather than taking a siesta. Uh, maybe this is why many people thought that the late Nuncio uh, was more American uh, than Italian. Uh, I want to, uh, however, uh, use this moment as well to have uh, just a recognition in silence of the suffering that's going on today in Ukraine um, and to say a silent prayer for all the victims who are uh, being uh, suffering this great onslaught. This uh, very tragic situation prompts me to recall what uh, Pope Francis wrote in Fratelli Tutti. Every war leaves our world worse than it was before. War is a failure of politics and of humanity. It's a shameful capitulation, a stinging defeat before the forces of evil. Let us not remain mired in theoretical discussions, but touch the wound, wounded flesh of the, of the victims. Let us hear the true stories of these victims of violence. Look at reality through their eyes. Listen with an open heart to the stories that they tell. My hope is that we will listen to those stories. Surely those words take on a new meaning each day as we witness the homes that are being destroyed, refugees fleeing, and bodies being dumped in mass graves. Let us never tire of building bridges of peace. The Al-Walid Center here at Georgetown is a leader in this build, bridge building, fostering mutual respect among Christians and Muslims. As the world's two largest religious traditions, as we heard uh, already today, Muslims and Christians bear a unique responsibility for building bridges for the good of our communities, for the nation and the entire world. Lasting peace and justice in our world require members of our respective faith communities to know and respect one another. We need to lead the way. I've learned so much about Islam and the Muslim communities through dialogues, but also in personal encounters. One of them, just to share with you for a moment, I was visiting the Children's Hospital in Chicago some years ago, Lurie Children's Hospital. I, it's only about two blocks from where I live. And um, they give me a roster of people to visit. And so I'm going through the different wards. And a man came out of one of the rooms and asked me if I would like to see his daughter uh, who was sick. She wasn't on my list, but I said, sure. So I went in, and it was a Muslim family. Their daughter was sick. And after we prayed a bit and talked, he walked me out into the hallway again and said, are you curious about why I invited you to come to visit my daughter? And I said, yes, I was, but I was not sure how to ask. And he said, well, because in our tradition, it's a blessing to visit a sick person, and it's a double blessing to visit a sick child. I wanted to give you this blessing. Here, I thought I was doing something. <laughs> he was doing something for me. That, I think, is much of, characterizes much of what I've learned in our dialogues and my encounters with the Muslim people. There is so much that we have in common, a humanity that we share that we should always treasure. 
and make sure that we build on. That's the way in which we build bridges, by reclaiming our humanity. Um, the various programs that we uh, have here at uh, Georgetown, but also throughout the country through our dialogue, I think are so very uh, important to keep moving on. At the local level in Chicago, it's been a tremendous pleasure for me to join Muslim communities uh, for the annual iftar meal during the month of Ramadan. This gathering has been disrupted in the past two years because of COVID, but I really am pleased to tell you that I'm uh, scheduled uh, in for an in-person iftar meal this year. The program that precedes the meal educates those gathered about the topic of common concern for our communities. And this is a valued moment of learning a, about each other. And so I would encourage uh, all of uh, my Christian uh, colleagues and, and, and friends to join in that celebration as, as best you can, because it is an opportunity to break bread, uh, to break that fast and sharing in, in a meal in which we learn more about each other. Joining at table together moves our understanding of one another uh, from the head to the heart. We see in each other a common humanity that is all too easily overlooked in media portrayals of Muslims and also Christians. It's worthwhile to recall here uh, a key finding in the Alwa Lead Center's 2016 uh, Bridge Initiative report in this regard. This is what, it wrote, what is written there. Danger and dialogue uh, in American Catholic public opinion and portrayals of Islam. This impact survey uh, found that, quote, Catholics who know a Muslim personally or who have participated in dialogue or community service with Muslims often have very different views about Islam in interfaith dialogue than those who haven't interacted with Muslims. That is why that kind of interaction is so important. Organizing these local opportunities for personal engagement between Catholics and Muslims is essential to fostering understanding and mutual respect between our communities. They become irreplaceable moments of bridge building that we must encourage in all of our communities. You know, the metaphor of the bridge has a lot to offer us. Bridges span divides among peoples and places, and they offer a structural means of passage over previously impa impassable terrain. But bridges also have to be crossed by making a commitment to take one step at a time. It is those small steps patiently taken one at a time that provide us the means to build a better future together. This journey of walking together is what gives me hope. As I recall the recent advances that we have made in improving Muslim and Christian relations. There's a lot of work to be done, no doubt. And it's uh, an opportunity for us to redouble our efforts this evening. But we also need to celebrate where we, the progress we have made. And that is what I do here tonight in accepting this award. May we also remember that tonight's award depends upon our partnerships. Bridge building cannot be done alone. So I thank the many bridge builders gathered here tonight as I look over out of those communities, especially the young students who are here. I had a wonderful uh, exchange with them just before uh, dinner this evening in which I wanted to know something about their life, their majors, what it was like to come uh, to this university to study and to feel welcomed here. So let us cherish moments like this of being together, of having an opportunity just to break bread and to get to know each other. We are taking a one, one wonderful important step when we do this to enhance our shared goal of building mutual understanding and respect among our two communities. And so I want to thank Georgetown University again and the Alwa Lead Center for this great honor. May we all continue to uh, build bridges uh, in the work that we do for peace. And uh, let us also take the, the opportunity wherever we can to invite many others to cross those bridges that we build. Thank you. Thank you very much for that inspiring talk. It, it brought back to me the fact that we've come very far just in that we have this gathering. When I decided um, to do a doctorate 
in theology, having gotten my master's in teaching theology, <clears throat> I went to Temple University because it was the only place I wanted to go for a doctorate, but I didn't want to go to a Catholic university because I had been educated in the Catholic system, and I wanted to get a different perspective. And Temple University established a religion department that was like none other. That is, it was a department of world religions, and the degree was that you study major in one religion and minor in two. And I, who had been very much raised in a totally Italian Catholic tradition for years and years, found myself having to take a required course in world religions. And I wondered why, you know, studying about these Hindus and Buddhists. And all of a sudden, by the end of it, I decided that I would major in Hinduism, minor in Buddhism. And I went to the chair, and I thought, this is great, because I happened to study with an incredible Indian scholar who was really brilliant, and for some, to use my childhood language, for some dumb reason, he thought my paper was really good. And he said, we can turn this into a dissertation. And I was married. I wanted to get a degree as fast as I could, in a way, to kind of move on. And so I, with great pride, went to see the chair. And the chair said, well, we're finally hiring a Muslim. He's the last person you know, to get the final world religious tradition. And I said, well, that's really nice, but I'm not interested. Because in addition to being raised as a Roman Catholic in an Italian neighborhood, my parents moved to an all-Jewish neighborhood. And although I was the only, my brother and I the only non-Jews, I was the head of the Jewish club. And I remember seeing the movie The Exodus, always a climber. Um, and I remember, I remember seeing the, the Exodus and thinking that was historical, you know? And I thought, I've got to read the book. Uh, and, and so when he said, study Islam, I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> I've seen The Exodus, so why would I spend this time? And he was a, a, a very quiet, soft-spoken person, but at a certain point, he lost it and said, you Catholics are really getting to me. And what it was was this was a time when so many Catholics were leaving, you know, nuns, priests, etc., and many of them were going to temple and studying, and they became the leaders in the student graduate program. And so we had a majority. I didn't even go to their meetings, but he was dealing with the, the, the dialogue, you know, and so he kind of said, you've got to take this. And, and so I decided to take one course, and then when I decided to actually take the whole thing, all of my Catholic theologian buddies said, you'll never get a job, which was true. I, I couldn't get a job when I finished. And, uh, you know, you're leaving the Catholic situation. They'll always have theology departments, and you'll always have a job. And, and my mother's reaction was, why? I mean, it, you know, Islam was not on our radar, even being in cosmopolitan New York. Muslims existed in America, but they weren't identified as Muslims. They were Egyptian or Lebanese. The religion wasn't there. The mosques, the, the, the old mosques were in, in Iowa, and the Boston mosque wasn't in Boston. It was in Quincy, Mass. I mean, it was, there, there was no sort of interest. And so the idea that that would take off was really uh, amazing at the time. And I remember writing to the... Uh, John's former employee, employer, and um, suggesting that at a certain point that Islam become part of what was covered. And I received a very long, nice note that basically didn't say no, but it didn't say yes. Nothing ever you know, happened you know, with it. So it just reinforced for me there's not going to be any job. And so when I finished, there weren't any jobs. It was to find a job somehow teaching world religions. And the idea that we would jump from then to now which, when I think about it, is actually quite a few decades ago, but I don't want to get into how many. Uh, but still, within that compressed period of time, that we, we come to a point where Islam was a major presence in American education. Um, that its presence at Georgetown uh, was beyond belief in the, in, in the 1990s and onwards. The idea that you'd wind up creating the kind of center that the university made a commitment to, the idea that they would as I said before, hire the first full-time Muslim chaplain, the idea that you would have a reasonable number of Muslim students on campus, and the idea that there would be an openness to so many other faiths was jumped way ahead. To me, it was like taking what Vatican II said, and then we had a stalled period from my point of view, and then going into full throttle and moving forward. It, it was during this period of time that I began to hear about this Imam, Abdul Malik Mujahid, 
But it was quite a few years till I actually got to meet him. I mean, I heard that he had this thing called sound vision and that they provided a lot of materials for Muslim families and young Muslims. Uh, what was the, the famous Adam's, Adam's World? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so I, I, I heard all of that. And, and that was my, my frame of reference for this person. And I wind up discovering as I get to know him, but even when I knew him doing all of his work, and then I'll, 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 I'll lay it out for you in terms of his work. But when I knew him doing his work, I had no idea that he had been an award-winning author, never refers to himself, um, that he was a major interfaith leader. I have to help you with the projecting the image a little bit more. Um, <laughs> that, that he was involved so much with the parliament of religions, you know, I mean, to the degree that he was. I mean, that, that whole kind of profile. So you knew that he had this niche, but you didn't realize the way in which this beginning of a movement would develop in so many directions. Starting something where you wanted to talk about Muslims being visible, Muslims developing their own sense of themselves, but also uh, Muslims actually, uh, and dealing with the Muslim-Christian relationship, but how it would take off and become, he, and he'd become a, a global game changer, and, you know, in effect. Sound Vision's initial uh, mission was to cultivate the kind of harmony between Muslims and their neighbors but it quickly moved along. But in 1989, what struck me was that I had never heard that he wrote a book called Covering a Conversion to Islam, Untouchable Strategy for Protest in India, which focused on the Dalits, or the untouchables, who outside the traditional Hindu caste hierarchy, and how their mass conversion to Islam in the early 1980s demonstrated an indigenous and authentic response to longstanding legal, cultural, and religious prejudice. The book was the winner of the Outstanding Academic Book of the Year. All the years that I knew him, he never referred to the book or the award. You know, if you're around academics, you usually work in something like, we don't even have to. We know that the culture is we ask the other person, what's your latest book? You know, I mean, it's, you know that kind of thing. Now, they always sort of said, it, it's so much so that the thing you drive me nuts is you work, you finish a book, and somebody says to you the next day, you know, uh, so what's happened? And you say, my book was published yesterday. And they say, so what are you working on now? <laughs> so it's like, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know? And it goes on and on and on. Uh, and the fact that it would, would win those kinds of awards and never come up, and then moving to a major, from my point of view, extension, a transition and an extension, in 1992, at the height of the war in Bosnia, Mujahid established the Bosnia Task Force a coalition of organizations across the United States that advocated on behalf of Bosnians, victims of genocide and ethnic cleansing at the hands of the Serbian government. He joined with a number of organizations, including the National Organization of Women, this is back in 1992, to press for recognizing the illegality of rape during wartime in international law. And you realize how that's still seen as almost a vehicle that is used for oppression whether you look at what's happened to the Rohingyas, when you, you, know, you look at all of these situations in which uh, opposition groups or even governments engage in that kind of that activity. These efforts culminated in the UN Commission on Human Rights passing a resolution in 1993 that declared that rape to be a, a war victim and called for an international tribunal to prosecute these crimes. Again, I had no real idea of this. I got to really talk to him at a later period, so I didn't even see this earlier period. In 2001, realizing that human rights in every situation of war and genocide were unique and required more than one issue task force, Mujahid established Justice for All, which is an accredited NGO at the United Nations and is America's largest Muslim human rights and advocacy organization with consultative status at the United Nations. JFA, Justice for All, has been a major force and voice in addressing the rising trend of Islamophobia in the US and globally. And let me tell you, when we talk about Islamophobia, denial of that existed for decades. Even when we created Bridge, there were people who said, there is no such thing as Islamophobia. And for those of us that said, it's a social cancer and it's growing like cancer, it was, you're exaggerating. 
There is no such thing. For those of us that said, think of the horrors of anti-Semitism, and then think about when we're now seeing this kind of growing Islamophobia. The, the, the word itself was developed in the UK a couple of decades ago. The US never took a word, and then when it came in, there was a total resistance, not only among non-Muslims, but even among some Muslims who just thought that the word would be a problem, that what shouldn't really, you don't want to, like, as it were, stick your head up too far, you know, because you, you've, got, you've got enough of a problem being recognized or being treated as, 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 as an equal or a rising equal, and this could be just an excessive, you know, provocation. It launched successful campaigns to legally and politically challenge, then, the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Often the word Burma is used because many people don't really get their head around Myanmar. So you had the Burma Task Force. In 2015, he organized the BTF, this, this thing I loved, organized the BTF Task Force Conference at the Nobel Peace Institute in Oslo, Norway for which seven Nobel laureates, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Shireen Abadi, signed a statement that, quote, what the Rohingyas are facing is a textbook case of genocide in which an entire indigenous community is being systematically wiped out by the Burmese government. And to think about how easily that could be resisted, think about the way in which we so celebrated and venerated a woman who was imprisoned for so many years and received a Nobel Peace Prize and then still refused to acknowledge that. The influence that that would have for those that saw her as opposed to a group that was based in Chicago, you know, talking about what was really going on and how heinous it was. Justice for All has led the Save Uyghurs campaign. Very active. I've been on. I, the, on a lot of there, they, they do a lot of, if you get a chance, he does a lot of vid virtual programs where you go right into certain areas and you bring in experts, et cetera, and so you can really get a sense of what's happening because we still don't get the media. The media coverage will be when there's something that talks about how many people are imprisoned or killed, but not looking at how is this generated, you know, what, what are the seeds for this, you know, how is, you know, what is this going to become? And that campaign to stop the genocide and mass incarceration of more than a million Uyghurs, a predominantly Muslim Turkic ethnicity who live in China's northwestern Xinjiang province, which in fact should be independent, but a province in which for, for decades they've been moving in, the Chinese government moving in and putting into the responsible positions, uh, both in terms of power, political power, as, as well as, uh, if you will, security power, uh, to suppress, and now, creating a situation where they talk about that these are really, these are like re-education places. You know, it's like we're sending into a, a, an education place where they can really learn how to live with the modern world, when in fact what you're doing is suppressing. When in fact they're putting people, after the, the husband and, or the brother leaves, they're, they're actually putting a government person in the house to see whether or not people pray regularly, et cetera. Again, something that doesn't get a lot of coverage. And then, Justice for All's approach to Save the India campaign. It used to be easier in previous administrations because Modi wasn't allowed to come in, the current prime minister wasn't allowed to even come into this country. But under President Trump, he became totally accepted, addressed Congress, et cetera, and was seen as a mainstream leader. And that, that completely covered over what the realities uh, were that were going on. That campaign is highlighted the danger of Hindutva movement, and we've dealt with that. The, the center's been involved uh, in dealing with that, that, that movement in, in a national uh, kind of way. And um, two of our, its faculty, uh, myself and a colleague in the history department, have been involved with that. But that's a movement that in the US has gotten almost no coverage, because we look at India as you know, fast-growing country, uh, its economy, China's got this great economy, but the Indian economy is going to develop. We see all those other aspects, and the idea that not only significant discrimination going on, but violence and terror is taking place in terms of the actions that are being committed. Whether you talk about love jihad, which then says that you can't have a marriage between a Muslim and a Hindu because it's really a way in which Muslims are marrying Hindu women in order to convert them, and it's, and it's a threat. And then that becomes 
a, a real, or it's to attribute, initially to attribute the, the spread of COVID, that the genesis of COVID came from, from Indian Muslims, with, with the result that you had attacks taking place, areas being burned, et cetera. Again, not getting much coverage. And JFA's emphasis that it's not just dealing with what's happening, it's not just with dealing with what's happening to Muslims, it's what's happening to Christians also, and that isn't looked at enough. The extent to which Christian church has been burned, uh, the extent to which um, you've, you, you've had situations where the, the um, where uh, I've seen situations where, for example, the, uh, a Catholic school that, that has a prominent record of educating Hindu kids, et cetera, but it's, you know, it's run by an order of nuns, et cetera, where there's a threat to both the school's existence and arresting the, the principal. You know, that becomes a threat. Or the arrest and holding of a, of a, a very elderly, Je I think it was a very elderly Jesuit uh, who I think had Parkinson's, I forget, but it, at, at a certain point wound up dying. Uh, and again, virtually no media coverage, or maybe a blip that isn't even taken seriously. This is one of the reasons why I felt very proud about my team with Bridge, because we cover that every day, and we have those stories out there. And, and more and more, as we talk to our council, more and more major media are looking at Bridge for this kind of information. Every day, we, we generate and put out a report on, let's say, 20 articles from around the world dealing with Islamophobia and introduce it with two paragraphs so people can decide whether or not it's something that they want to see. And it's a repository for this kind of information. So media are now, when they go to address it, they're coming here. But why are they coming to us? Because there aren't a lot of outlets. Otherwise, why would they think of coming to us? You know, why wouldn't they be quoting other media? Not surprisingly, because of all of this work, Imam Mujahid, extraordinary, his extraordinary jihad, his extraordinary struggle, for righteousness and to spread social justice has drawn national and international recognition and resulted in his being selected as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world eight times, eight times. Given his extraordinary life's work, contributions, the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding is delighted to present my friend with the Bridges Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Wait a minute, I've learned how to smile. <laughs> Hurry up, I'm going to cry. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening and assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, President uh, John DeJoya, for <clears throat> not only organizing, but this beautiful setting. I'd rather spend a day or two right in this place. I don't know whether I will be able to climb, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. You know, Catholics have always been very kind to me. I was born in a Catholic hospital, and uh, nuns in a close-by church were sort of my mom's friends, so we used to call them khala or aunties. Uh, and thank you, John. I would say you have built more bridges of understanding in America than any Muslim. So thank you so much. Truly appreciate that, what you do, the godly work. I attended a madrasa in Pakistan only 17 years after British has left. There were villages around us which were bombed by newly born British Air Force just a few years before independence. We had uh, detention centers 
in which um, tens of thousands of Hoods were detained, which were only liberated after Pakistan came into being. And our Peer, Peer Pagara was hanged to death four years before Pakistan came into being. So in that context, once in our madrasa, a Christian convert to Islam came and is addressed our masjid, and we were all attentive, you know, a Christian who has converted to Islam. And it was a village setting. And when he stood up, he said, I am going around warning Muslims about Christians. Christians have an army in Pakistan. And all we could hear is British are coming, British are coming. <laughs> because Christian and British at that time in that village for me, more or less the same thing. And we knew what British did. He said, they are so bold, they even have an army in Pakistan. And at that was the time in a pin drop silence, he shared the name of that Christian army which was conquering Pakistan. Its name was Salvation Army. <laughs> it took me, oh, we didn't laugh. <laughs> we did not laugh. <laughs> No, Madrasa didn't start training us to defend against the Christian army. We keep reading our fiqa and tafsir and the Quran. It took me a while walking on a Christmas season in downtown Chicago when I first time encountered that Christian army conquering America <laughs> with their, uh, of course they had the uniform, but they also had the a cattle also. So I decided I'm going to join that army and give some money. <laughs> so no, I'm not the only Muslim, by the way, who does that. Uh, there is a person in, in this area. His first name even is Muslim. He takes care of funding Salvation Army program of feeding poor and homeless in Washington, D.C. He did it for three, four years without anyone knowing who is funding. It entirely funds it. And then he continuously does that. So there are few more soldiers, Muslim soldiers of that Christian army who was about to conquer Pakistan. <laughs> I hope they conquer America thoroughly. Now, <clears throat> whenever, of course, I hear about a farmer Muslim or a terrorist who has found Jesus telling Christians in their churches that Muslims are coming. I say, yeah, I have seen that one before. <laughs> the Islamophobia machine, but, but you know, this is not a laughing matter, this Islamophobia. Even institutions are involved just this morning, I think yesterday came out the news that an Indian high court gave a decision uh, that uh, hijab is not part of Islam. And they have banned girls attending school unless you take off your scarf. So institutions are now part of this Islamophobia. So Islamophobia machine, funded, of course, heavily in the United States, uh, where uh, more than 200 laws have been submitted to states. Same law, just copy and paste. Somebody knew that game before. It causes, according to a survey, 56% Muslim children to feel unsafe in schools. That's a California survey of last year. The same Islamophobia that says Muslim are taking over the world, that we must fight those quote-unquote terrorists, has allowed China to build the largest concentration camps since the Nazis. And the Holocaust Museum of your city consider now India is heading towards the direction of genocide. That's a serious thing, which is hardly known here. 
At this moment, I'll take a short break to introduce. We have the world leader, chair of the World Uyghur Congress, who at my invitation joined us here. Would you please stand up, my brother Omar Kanat. Thank you so much. We work with him under his guidance. And you also have the chairperson of uh, Muslim Council of Virginia with us, Brother Rafi. Could you please recognize yourself? <laughs> and I don't know why this lady is taking all these photos. Hina Zuberi, she is uh, our leader of justice for all who does all this advocacy work in this area. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in, it is in this context of Islamophobia that Building Bridges Project of Georgetown is highly appreciated by the Muslim community. It is something we look up to. Because when Muslims speak, for some reason, we're somewhat discounted that our voice is not authentic. So Georgetown University, thank you for allowing a person like John Esposito to still be with you. Unlike playing the good Muslim and bad Muslim game, which goes on, I was addressing Congress. Uh, there were about two, 300 congressperson and staffers. There was a Jewish guy, Catholic, and myself. So after hearing my speech, person comes to me, oh, so f finally so good to meet a good Muslim. <laughs> you know, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> I say, well, I'm very bad, brother. <laughs> you know, Hyde Parker's nose <laughs> is caught what I'm talking about here. So instead of playing the good Muslim, bad Muslim game, the Building Bridges Project has grounded itself in authenticity and courageous scholarship. A scholarship is about tons of PhD there. Courage and scholarship is still rare in our beloved country. So thank you so much for work which you do. Well, friends, and especially Archbishop, my first encounter with Catholic institution as a grown-up person, not as a calling nuns aunties, because nuns used to dress there just like my mom. So calling them khalas were a very easy thing. The only problem I have is that in that church, they had these huge trees of berries. We call them shaitut. I don't know what's the English word for it. And those nuns will not let us take those. You know, why nuns have always these type of stereotypical images? We call them khalas, but we'll be a little careful about them. But first encounter with Catholic institution was in Chicago. The late Cardinal Bernardine initiated the first meeting by inviting Muslim leaders in Chicago. And I was present there. He mentioned that Catholic schools are facing challenges while Muslim are trying to build their educational institution. Why not we work together? Well, we did. Today, DePaul, Loyola, and Benedictine universities in greater Chicago areas has substantial Muslim student body. And as a matter of fact, I called to get the numbers. I got it from Benedictine University. 17 to 20% of the student body at Benedictine University are Muslim students. So, so conversation, Archbishop, has a way of engaging people, as you have rightfully says. So Catholic and Muslims working together founded United Power for Justice Action in Chicago. It's an industrial area, if you don't know, United Power Industrial Area Foundation. And it was encouragement by Catholics. Otherwise, Muslims were not thinking about that. It is now a coalition of about 80 different institutions, mostly Catholic and many Muslims. One of our successful campaign was to provide health coverage to all uninsured children, which I suggested and led regardless of income, health status, and citizenship. Within a few months, Catholics and Muslims working together, all kids program became a law. 
in Illinois. It took the state of Illinois from being 42nd worst in the country as second best in the country. This is before Obamacare came into being. And the first year, 50,000 poor children who were uninsured were insured because of that program. So power of working together, Catholics and Muslims, delivered for the whole society, not just for Muslims and Catholics. So friends, the world needs people of faith to tame the power of arrogance. While the Russian invasion of Ukraine rightfully dominates the news, I would like to bring you to your attention an extremely serious news which got buried in the news cycle. India fired a nuclear-capable ballistic missile in Pakistan, another atomic power. No one in the world noticed that. It came in the news. India says it was an accident. The story is over. What about that accident was going from Pakistan's direction to India? What will be the news cycle like? What about, God forbid, if that missile, when it was misfired accidentally, had an atomic bomb? These people have atomic bombs. And I wonder if someone in Russia or in Pentagon is thinking that conventional warfare among the nuclear powers is possible. Why do I say? Because just recently, in a Council for Foreign Relations in New York, there was a program, and I was startled to hear an Indian scholar arguing that conventional warfare between nuclear power is possible. He said safely. Safely? God forbid. But these conversations are important to keep an eye in the world which is more divisive and another cold war in front of us. And that's why I wonder if we need to pay more attention to scholars like Professor Meir Scheimer of the University of Chicago and Stephen Waltz of the Harvard as the world is embarking upon another Cold War. Ladies and gentlemen, our well-being depends on everyone else's well-being in the world. And that is why we must become stronger and better bridge builders. We must dismantle the vicious cycle of war, terror, and hate. While the struggle to change our world and ourselves may be long and painful, it will make us more deserving of God's mercy, inshallah, his true servants. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Your Eminence, Cardinal Subic, uh, Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid, for being with us tonight and for being a great inspiration for all of us. Uh, before inviting uh, Father Benjamin Hawley for the benediction, I would like to thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the honor to be here tonight to pray with you and to meet with you. In the first half of my life, I was not a Jesuit and I was not Catholic. I lived for three years in a small village in now Burkina Faso, a Muslim village. I worked for the Agency for International Development. I lived in Indonesia for five and a half years. I lived here in Washington, backstopping programs in Lebanon, Jordan, Oman, West Bank, and Gaza. I've made multiple trips to Jordan, multiple trips to Oman. And my first experience as a Catholic was in Yemen, which I left only two months before the 
Gulf War began. So I've lived in communities, as the communities have celebrated Ramadan, uh, Eid al-Fitri, Eid al-Adha, and I've wakened up many mornings at the sound of the Bejuan calling the faithful to prayer. So I'm deeply grateful to be here with you tonight. So in the midst of our joy and our thanksgiving, let's take a moment in silence to appreciate yet more deeply what we have all experienced in this evening. Inspired by gratitude and our need for God's continual blessing, let us pray. Good and gracious God, our creator, source of all mercy, forgiveness, and love, we thank you for all we have experienced tonight. We thank you for raising up men and women outstanding in virtue to lead and guide us into your way of peace. We thank you in particular for our honorees and our distinguished guests and for the vital work they do and have done. May your blessing on what has transpired this evening inspire our continued service to you and to your people, those who love us and work with us, those who choose not to love us nor work with us for any reason. May your mercy and grace fill our hearts and our minds so that we can be united with you for the cause of justice and peace, for Christians and Muslims, for men and women of all faiths and no faith, and all who strive for reconciliation. We ask you to pour out your blessing upon them and upon us all as we prepare to leave this place renewed and refreshed in one another's presence, knowing that you are always with us. And we pray in your great name, saying together, Amen. I want to thank you all for uh, coming this evening and spending this time with us. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank our honorees for the lifetime achievement that they've had and, and hope that they'll continue to work for it. And I want to thank Georgetown University that has been a place that so many of us have been able to feel that we can make a difference. Thank you. <laughs>